the, the record, the record of the Jewish people and their anticipation of the establishment of or the reestablishment of an earthly kingdom. And, uh, and that would be uh, led by a king uh, after the likeness of David, who was in their minds the greatest of, the greatest of all the kings. And so we, we closed uh, looking at uh, the mistaken understanding that the disciples had concerning the kingdom and its nature. And not only when I say disciples, I mean that would also include uh, the 12 apostles. And we also noted that this misunderstanding uh, continued even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, that uh, his death and his burial and his resurrection uh, in no way dissuaded the apostles from their ideas concerning the nature of the kingdom. And we know that because of what they asked Jesus in Acts chapter 1. They said, wilt thou at this time restore the, the kingdom to Israel? So they're still looking, they're still looking for an earthly kingdom. Uh, they do at least believe that Jesus is the one that's going to be king. Uh, they have at least made that uh, a point of recognition. Then Jesus again corrects them, and uh, in fact, it's a very brief and terse uh, uh, rebuttal and rejection of their line of thinking. And the interesting thing is, is that Jesus uh, made no real attempt to teach them anything more about the kingdom. Uh, in other words, it's for example, remember in the, in John uh, in John fourteen. And, you know, and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And, uh, and, and Philip says, you know, Lord, if, if you'll just show us, you know, if you'll just show us the Father. Show us the Father, and it will be sufficient. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long that you would say, show us the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, there was a misunderstanding there. And Jesus, even though that his time was short, because that's you know that's the night he was betrayed, he still took time to correct Philip's misunderstanding and, and try to teach him something. But in this case, Jesus is done teaching. I mean, Jesus is, has in essence taught everything everything he's going to teach. Uh, he's fulfilled the work that the Father sent him to do. And so when they had this misunderstanding about the kingdom, Jesus just simply said, it's not, it's not for you to know the days and the times and the seasons that, you know, that the Father has put in, into my hand. And, he's, and in essence, he says, just, just wait a few days. <laughs> just go to Jerusalem and wait a few days, and, and, and you'll receive the, the Holy Spirit, you'll receive power from above. And so they did that. And it wasn't until that, that point in time, on the day of Pentecost, that all of their misunderstandings about the kingdom were resolved. In other words, all the teaching that Jesus did, and, and don't take this the wrong way, was not, all the teaching that he did was not sufficient to overcome their misunderstandings and misperceptions. Uh, there was a sense, and by the way, if you, it, in the previous part of the lesson and, and, and moving forward, uh, Stroop talks uh, somewhat about a, a blind, there's a blindness and uh, some of the material that I'm studying now in preparation for the debate talks about that Jesus taught in parables in order to keep those who were spiritually blind to keep them in the dark. In other words, if they wanted to know, they could know, but if they weren't truly interested, then they would just remain in spiritual blindness. And so there was a sense in which the apostles continued in a spiritual blindness until the day of Pentecost. And I, I would assume it was just to the point that Jesus' his work was, was finished. The teaching was done. He was going to leave it in their hands. And, and that he knew that on the day of Pentecost, all of these misunderstandings would be resolved, which they were. And that, uh, now note, let me turn over here on to a page, uh, well, in 58 and 59, it talks about all of, uh, of the things pertaining to, uh, to the coming of the kingdom, but over on page, uh, over on page sixty-one, there are, there's some detail given concerning uh, their misunderstanding of, uh, concerning the kingdom, in that they believed that the, the establishment of the kingdom was imminent. 
Now, there was a good reason for them to believe that, because it was. There's also another good reason for them to believe that. That's what John preached, and that's what Jesus preached. If something is at hand, it's close by. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. But uh, uh, but uh, moving to uh, uh, moving down to bottom page 61 and over to 62, it, looking at uh, all the things that were accomplished in Christ, that these things were not uh, 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 clarified in their mind until Acts 2. Uh, also, and I've never thought about it this way before, but and there, I don't know if there's anything to it or not. But you know, in John 16, Jesus told his apostles, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. And he also said, he will bring to your remembrance everything that I have said to you. And so the, I think there's a sense in which both of those things work together. In other words, there was a body of knowledge possessed by the apostles. They didn't know how to apply it. But they didn't understand it and know how to apply it. That second half, they're going to they're gonna look back, and we do this in everyday life. You, 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 you know, uh, you, you've done something, or, or something's been always been this way, and then you, you realize why it is. Right. Later. Right. It's not like an epiphany or something like that. Yeah, that well, you know, and you know, John... Uh, John talked about that all the way in the beginning of his epi uh, uh, of his gospel in, in chapter 2 when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Now, this is early on in the, in the ministry of Jesus. And John goes on to say at that point in time, they did not understand this saying until Jesus was raised from the dead. And so, so they walked around three years with that bit of information. Not having any idea how to apply it. And then all of a sudden there's a sudden realization. Oh, ah, that's what he meant. Yeah. And so I think the same thing goes with the kingdom. Is that they had this huge body of, of, of wealth of information. I won't call it knowledge because I think knowledge implies that you know how to use it. They had a wealth of information about the kingdom. But didn't know how to apply it because they didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. And then, when the Holy Spirit reminds them of everything that he said, all of the kingdom parables, for example, in, in, in Matthew and Luke. And then, all of a sudden, boom, the understanding of all those things is brought to fruition. Then you have, in the first sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, instruction given, given, excuse me, Concerning the nature of the kingdom. Look on page 62. And in the uh, in the second or the first full paragraph there, about eight or nine lines down, there's a quotation from Acts 2.29. Brethren, let me freely speak to you, the patriarch of David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulchres with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. Note two things here. Or first, first thing. Raise up Christ, the anointed one, to sit on David's throne. That's kingdom talk. You know, thrones are for kings. So, so the, you have kingdom talk here. There. And he says, he seen this before spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did or Hades, neither did his flesh see corruption. And so we have a we have a definition of what it means, first of all, for Christ to reign in his kingdom and sit on the throne of David. It's his resurrection. And yet so many of our religious friends and neighbors believe that Jesus is going to come back in some kind of bodily form and establish an earthly kingdom and sit on it in Jerusalem and reign in Jerusalem when Peter said, by inspiration, I mean, look, by, look, a lot of times when Paul wrote letters, I don't know that he actually had it in his mind that the Holy Spirit, you know, I'm, I'm writing what the Holy Spirit has given me because I, I think you, you see his personality, you know, in, the, in his writings. But when Peter said what he said, he was under the direct influence of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And so, so Peter is speaking here with regard to what it means for Christ to sit on David's throne. 
and why people refuse to let Peter explain what that means rather than chasing off all kind of crazy <clears throat> half-witted theories about Jesus coming back to, to, to reign on this earth, I, I'll never understand. Peter explained it by direct, under the direct influence of the Holy Spirit. The resurrection of Christ is, is the explanation of Jesus sitting on the throne of David. And then it goes on and says, for, uh, 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 Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, uh, you have received the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's poured forth this, which you both see and hear. For David is not yet ascended into the heavens, but he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Again, kingdom talk. Christ, anointed one. And so in the very first in the very first sermon that Peter preaches in the days following the resurrection of Jesus, he immediately enters into kingdom talk and explaining that Jesus is the king. He's sitting on the throne of David as is evidenced by his resurrection from the dead. And so I think it's important for us uh, uh, to make that uh, to make that note. Uh, um, that, uh, that that even though Peter, right up until about five minutes ago, didn't understand the kingdom, now he understands fully the nature of the kingdom, and he's preaching that uh, he's preaching that to uh, his audience. And then on page sixty-three, uh, Stroop continues to talk about how much the kingdom is mentioned. Go ahead, John. Before you go any further, do you think the general public at this time had a problem with heaven? Concept of heaven and resurrection? No, not, not, not among the Jews. Not among the Jews. I, I, I'm going to explain why. Uh, when Lazarus died, right. All right, Lazarus died, and Jesus intentionally did not go to Bethany for four days. And when Jesus comes to Bethany, you know, Mary and Martha both met him at different times and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus says to Mary, your brother will rise again. And then she says, I know he will rise again at the last day. And then Jesus says, yeah, but in addition to that, he's, in essence, he's going to rise now. You know, I'm the resurrection and the life. Yeah, but when you said, when you put her in the group of his, aside from everyone else, as, as, as someone that's been taught and knows, Rather than the guy down the street. You see what I'm saying? There has to be a reason. Because this bothers me. Why, why God, and I'm not blaming him, I'm just saying why, why there's a, 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 such a misunderstanding <coughs> about the kingdom. I, I thought about this every time. But that was I'm going to mess you up. Going well, no. Uh, <coughs> I, I may mention this in the last couple of weeks. Um, I think one reason is is it, it, it eventually it taught the Jews it taught the Jews that a lesson in humility that they thought they had it all worked out and they had it all figured out and they couldn't have been more wrong and I made mention of this last week the week before in uh, Ben Shapiro's discussion with William Lane Craig about uh, the testimony of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And Shapiro, you know, Shapiro is an Orthodox Jew. And his argument is, you know, Jesus, you know, Jesus as he's presented in the New Testament is nothing like the Jesus that all of Jewish history has been looking for. And Craig says, that's exactly right. They got it wrong. And that just kind of that just kind of made Shapiro draw up a little bit, you know. The, the idea that you, know, you know this Jew this Jewish arrogance continues to this day in regard in regard to Jesus. And 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 William Lane Craig said that's exactly right. He was nothing like what they were looking for, and that's what the text even goes the New Testament text points out. And then he says, and furthermore, the fact. That God raised Jesus from the dead is testimony to the fact that they got it wrong. 
Because yeah. Shapiro said, well, the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead is no big deal because obviously Shapiro believed that all the Old Testament records that people have been raised from the dead. A lot of people were raised from the dead in Old Testament. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when Paul said, you know, uh, when Paul said to Agrippa, you know, why, why would you marvel that, somebody, that God would raise a man from the dead? Do you believe the prophets? I know you believe the prophets. In other words, Agrippa, you know the Old Testament. People have been raised from the dead before. And so Shapiro tried to make that statement, but then Craig said, Craig cut him off and said, yes, but the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead validated everything that Jesus said about himself and his kingdom. And then that's when Shapiro decided he would change subject. You know, and, and kind of just blew it off. He, well, I, I find all this uninteresting. Well, it's because he just ate your sack lunch. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I would find it uninteresting too if I'd have made a statement like you did, and in about two sentences, you just completely, you know, you just, com you know, completely destroyed, you know, what I had said. That, that really says something because Shapiro was always like three pages ahead of everybody. That's exactly right. You know, he knew he was fixing to be made fool of, and it was crowd control. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if he pursued that any further, Craig would have. And by the way, this was not a combative debate. This was a sit down discussion on, on Shapiro's show. These guys are friends. I mean, obviously, they have some, some, some severe religious differences. But, but the point was is that, that Shapiro made the point, I mean, that Craig made the point that they all missed it, and the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead was testimony to them, uh, testimony to them that they missed it. All right, and so I, John, I think that's the essence of it. Is showing that you guys thought you had this right all along, and you couldn't have been more wrong. Yeah. I, Sean just said Shapiro was shut down by the truth, and I said he was confounded by the truth. He was confounded by the truth. It, it, it sold him up. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so I think that has a lot to do with it, uh, because there is the continue there is the continued preaching. <clears throat> Somebody keeps trying to call me. And the reason probably is because here's the third time for this number to, to call because of the horses that I've been chasing around all morning that aren't mine and we don't know who they are. And I actually, I say actually, I, I put my number on Facebook so people could call me about the horses. This is probably it. So if you're watching Facebook, I'm not answering. <laughs> <laughs> all right, because uh, I am live on Facebook, so they they, they saw that number somewhere. All right, so uh, so getting back to the the, the the nature of the kingdom is that, that Peter immediately begins this kingdom discussion because now he has he has a proper understanding of what of what the kingdom uh, is uh, is really all about. But I want him to go down to page middle of page sixty four and 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 note and you know I told you from the outset of this lesson I think Stroop oversold his church is not the kingdom then. You know, he, he really made this huge emphasis that the church is not the kingdom. And then in one sentence, when he got done with it, he goes, well, it's not always the kingdom. Well, so then, so then he's going to start going in. He's going to start overselling. He's kind of going to oversell the idea uh, of, of two kingdoms. And there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom, there's the kingdom that exists in the here and now. And there's still yet another kingdom that we expect to inherit. All right? And the Bible is clear on that. It is proper to say that the kingdom is the church. When we use those terms as the Bible uses them. I mean, for example, in Colossians 1.13, we have been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So... There's no question we are in we are presently in a kingdom. Right. But then when he hands the kingdom over. That's the next kingdom. That and that and that's that's where I'm going. Because there is a kingdom now. And the, the, the passage that John is referencing is 1 Corinthians 15, 23, and 24. Then cometh the end. When he will deliver up the kingdom even to God, even the Father, and he will put down all reign or rule and all authority. For he must reign until God puts all things under his feet, enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be put under his feet is death. And so there is going to be a time when Jesus no longer reigns in his kingdom. Because he's going to take his kingdom 
and give it to the Father. Now, we already know when he's going to do that. He's going to do that as a judgment. Then cometh the end. So he's reigning now, which means he is a king. He's reigning now, which means there is a king. But the text is also, the biblical text is also clear that there is yet a kingdom to be inherited that is different from the kingdom that we, in which we now exist. Uh, uh, you know, for example, on the great judgment scene of Matthew 25, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the what? Kingdom. The kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's not the one we're in now. Uh, uh, you know, that we're heirs of the kingdom. So there's a lot, there are a lot of, there's a lot of texts, biblical texts that tell us there is a kingdom yet for us to inherit. And so there is a sense in which there are two kingdoms. I, I'll give you another example. <clears throat> What's Walter's favorite text? What's your favorite text, Walter? I want your favorite text. Well, I if, I, if I gave you, if I told you, Walter, you got two minutes to do a Wednesday night Devo, what, what, what verses are you going to go to? Well, fear God and keep his No, that's not where you go. I got 25 years, I got 25 years of evidence to, to tell you that ain't right. You know where Walter's going to go? He's going to go to Second Peter chapter 1. He's going to talk about the Christian graces. All right? But at the end of the Christian graces, it says, if you do these things, what? You shall never fall. But then what fall was that? There shall be an abundant entrance made for you into the everlasting kingdom. That's right. So were they, was he writing to people that were in the kingdom? He absolutely was. But what did he say? You're in a kingdom now. You still have work to do when you complete when you complete that task, an entrance will be made into another kingdom, an everlasting kingdom. All right? And so, man, this, this person is very persistent. A lot of them think, That's like seven calls. A lot of them think that still not answering. Kingdom's going to be on Israel, even though go like the president and all. Oh, yeah, there's, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, still a ton, there's still a ton of people talking about, talking about an earthly kingdom. And for the last... Well, since nineteen, well, since nineteen forties, the, the the one of the primary one of the primary emphases of our foreign policy has been to make sure that Israel is protected because people have this idea that God has some kind of deal with the Jews, which He does not. But even though it's a even though it's a flawed philosophy, it has been helpful because <laughs> we need we needed somebody over there to, to keep the Muslims in check. And so, so there has there has been some benefit to it, even though it's the product of a, of a, of a flawed uh, political and religious uh, philosophy. All right, but note on page sixty four. All right, so we're making the distinction that there is a kingdom now, and yet there still remains a kingdom uh, to be uh, to be uh, inherited. All right, in the middle of sixty four, it says, "What are we told about this kingdom?" which was preached by Jesus and the apostles. Well, the first thing we were taught is it's different. It's a different kingdom. Uh, for example, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. Right? Is the kingdom in this world? It's in the world, but it's not of the world. It didn't originate, it didn't arise from this world. So my kingdom is not of this world. All right, so it, it's different in that sense, in that sense. That it exists in some way in a physical in a physical sense, in that there are people that are in it, but it's different in the sense that there are no geographical boundaries. Uh, you know, there's not there's not a, there's not a king that we can see. Uh, you know, who's ruling from day to day. It's it's a different kind of kingdom. Uh, also, it's a kingdom that exists within the confines of other kingdoms. For example, the kingdom of God, the church, can and does exist within the confines of other kingdoms. Correct? It's on earth. It's on earth. I mean, so therefore, and one thing I think that, just as an aside, one thing that I think communists and, and socialists and, and others felt, failed to understand is 
is what Jesus tried to explain to Pilate is that I'm a king and I have a kingdom, but my kingdom is not a threat to your kingdom. Right? I mean, the, the church is not a threat to any physical kingdom. I guess we might say, so long as, as so long as whoever's in charge of that kingdom wants to do right. I mean, can the church exist in communist China? It does. It does exist in communist China. But even if the government allowed the church, even if the government allowed the church to practice its faith openly, which it cannot do, would the church be a threat to communist China if they allowed it to practice? No. Why? Because our citizenship in the church has no bearing on whatever system of government is in charge. In other words, if they, if they leave Christians alone and let us practice our faith, we'll be the best citizens that they have, right? Whether it's communist or socialist or, or a dictatorship, it doesn't. In other words, no, no, because what does the Bible tell us about our relationship to our, to our governmental rulers? That's right. Obey them, pay our taxes, live quiet and peaceable lives, help our neighbor. I mean, <laughs> no, the, 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 the kingdom of God is no threat to any governmental system. The problem is that those that are involved in those types of governmental systems don't understand that. And I think perhaps one reason might be because they perceive that the United States government is tied to religion because those they seem to be so closely intertwined. But that's, it's just not true, you see. It, our government's influenced by Christian principles. But if our government decided to go absolutely, totally sec secular, nothing changes. We still obey, we still obey our government. You know, we still honor the king. You know, we still uh, you know, pay taxes, you know, give honor to whom honor is due, custom to whom custom is due. Well, a custom is, is money. Okay, you know, that's tax money. And so it is a different kingdom. Uh, also, it's a different kingdom in the sense that it is not expanded through political or military means. For example, in Isaiah 2, verses 2 and following, we all know about you know, the house, you know, the Lord's house will be established in the mountains and exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. But then it falls up with, in this kingdom men shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So it tells us that the nature of the kingdom of God is not militaristic. It's not it, it's apolitical. It's not unpolitical. It's apolitical. It, it's it's completely separated uh, 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 from 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 politics, and so that also makes it not a threat. Makes it not a threat. And then then you think about you know what was you know you know who was large and in charge when the church was established? Politically speaking, Rome, Rome. And yet, the, and the church was no real threat to Rome, right? And so, and so, it, it's a kingdom that is unlike any other kingdom. It's not, it's not expanded through through military force or military might. It's not expanded through uh, through political gains. And, and this is another reason why, at, as a religious body, we need to stay separate from our government as much as we can. Because the minute, the minute you start allowing the church and the government to intertwine with one another, you know, in other words, you don't want the government to get their tentacles into you. Because once you start doing that, it's problematic. Because then the government's going to try to control you. If you keep it separate the way it's supposed to be, the you, know, you leave the government alone, the government leave you alone. Think about this. The establishment of Roman Catholicism was due in large part to the apostasy of the church, for lack of a better term, jumping in bed with the Roman government. You know, when the, when the, when the Roman government, uh, uh, when the uh, when when the apostate church joined forces with the Roman government, 
Then the government started doing the bidding of the church, and the church started doing the bidding of the government. And, it, and then the, the whole identity of the church was completely lost. By the way, if you look at, if you look at, man, it's like 12 times this person's called. They're still called. I'm still not answering. All right? So uh, if you look at the hierarchy, you look at the hierarchy of the Roman <coughs> Catholic Church, it is a mirror image of the hierarchy of the Roman, of the Roman government. A singular figure at the top. Caesar and the Pope. Romans had their Senate. Catholic Church has the College of the Cardinals. And then you've got, and then you've got, you know, another word, it's just like a giant pyramid all the way down in the Roman government, and the Roman Catholic Church is organized just like it. You know, they didn't learn that organization from the Bible. They learned it when they, when they were in cahoots with the Roman government. And so, and so the nature of the true church is vastly different than, than the nature of any, other, of any other type of kingdom. Um, and then at the bottom of page 65, and this is where John and I were talking about just a second ago with 1 Corinthians 15. Last, uh, last sentence there. It is clear that Jesus shall reign until time shall be no more, until all human kingdoms and powers have been destroyed. Thus, of the kingdom over which the seed of David reigned, there shall be no end in the sense in which man thought of such. Now, I really don't, have we had a bell yet? Okay. I won't make mention of this. Sometimes, sometimes the metaphor of the church and the kingdom can, can be confusing and some of the language that surrounds it can be confusing. And I, I'll get to this somewhat next week. Right. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, as Daniel explains Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the great image with the head of gold and the, and the arms and chest of silver and the belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron and feet, iron mixed with clay, then it says there was a small stone that came out and crushed that kingdom, a, a stone made without hand. And it crushed, it crushed that image. And it says of that kingdom, it says, It shall be an everlasting kingdom which shall never be destroyed. All right? So sometimes we take it, into, take it into our minds that the church is a kingdom that will last forever. But there's a sense, there's a sense in which that is true, but there's also a sense in which it is not true. For example... When the church is carried up into heaven, is the church going to be is the church going to be the kingdom up there? No. Just like Judaism is not going to be the kingdom up there, and the patriarchs are not going to be in charge up there. In other words, once all from the patriarchal age and the Jewish age and the Christian age get to heaven, all of those will be melded into the everlast into the everlasting king. So in that sense. We can say that the church will never be destroyed. Now the church will cease to exist. There won't be a church. There won't be a church in heaven in the sense in which we think about it. It won't be more like it won't be. It won't be, it won't be in, uh, evolved. It won't evolve into it. In other words, right? there you go. It will be absorbed. That's right. It'll be absorbed. Just That's like, right. Just like other kingdoms did before. When they went out, <laughs> their borders they absorbed, and you became or you're out. Right, that's exactly right. Yeah, the kingdom, of, the, the kingdom which is the church, will be absorbed into the everlasting kingdom, just like the patriarchal. That's world. exactly right. And so it will continue to exist, but not in its current form and structure and organization. Now, there's another kingdom passage in the book of Daniel, which is us. Which, yeah, which is also I think relevant. Which is, that says that Jesus received his kingdom when he ascended. You know, Daniel said, I saw uh, in the night visions, and behold, one like unto the Son of Man uh, came before the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him glory and, and, and dominion and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. It's an everlasting kingdom. All right, so it's an ever, but. It started when Jesus ascended. It is an everlasting kingdom in the sense that those that are citizens thereof will be absorbed into the ultimate eternal kingdom. 
And so, and the reason I'm mentioning all this is, is because sometimes, sometimes we take, and, and look, when I say we, I'm talking about me, because I, you know, nobody's taught on the kingdom in this place more than me in the last 23 years. And I, I think sometimes, and I think sometimes, well, in fact, I know sometimes that I've used language that should be applied to the everlasting kingdom, and I've applied it to the temporary kingdom. And, and, and maybe created some confusion if somebody were to dig deep enough, dig, dig deep enough into it. And so I want to make that distinction. Now, on the top of page 65, on the top of page 65, you see in this first full paragraph where it says, Just as there is a temporal kingdom, we also learn there is an eternal kingdom. And that is where we will pick up, uh, we'll pick up right there uh, next Sunday. All right, that'll be the 14th. 